About two years ago, I found out that I had gone from an insulin sensitive state to an insulin resistant state. And I knew at that time that it was very important to figure out why, because insulin resistance causes a number of bad health outcomes like early heart attacks, early strokes, prediabetes, and even early cancer. Fortunately, the cause of insulin resistance that we'll talk about today is easily reversible in most individuals, but unfortunately, it's a lot more common than most people realize because it's typically silent. And that is a deficiency in a raw material that when supplemented or obtained in adequate amounts through the diet can lead to substantial improvements in insulin sensitivity and some evidence suggests even glycemic control. We'll talk about the science and the clinical evidence and that raw material is magnesium. We need specific raw materials to drive the chemical reactions that are responsible for producing energy for our bodies to use. And when we don't have those raw materials, metabolism becomes dysfunctional. And because magnesium is deeply involved in glucose metabolism and the pathways that are responsible for proper functioning of insulin, a deficiency in magnesium can cause insulin resistance and it can also make underlying conditions like diabetes even worse than they needed to be. We'll talk about the biology of that in just a moment. But first, how common is magnesium deficiency? Depends on who you ask. About 15% of individuals have measurable magnesium deficiency on routine clinical labs. This is measuring something called the serum magnesium or the cell-free part of the blood that's drawn on routine labs. But the problem is that you can be magnesium deficient throughout the whole body without having an abnormal serum magnesium level. And that's because magnesium is locked away inside of the skeletal system and primarily in the intracellular space. And what we're measuring on routine labs is a proxy of what's going on in the extracellular space. Serum magnesium is regulated by things like the kidneys. So by the time magnesium drops below normal on a serum magnesium test, total body magnesium might be more significantly depleted. That makes it difficult to figure out who exactly has magnesium deficiency, and there are some advanced tests, but we also know about risk factors. For example, someone who spends a lot of time in endurance athletics will lose more magnesium through sweat and through urine. Similarly, someone who's on diuretics or who has a lot of alcohol intake or who has abnormal glycemic control, like in diabetes, are gonna be losing more magnesium and potentially also intaking less magnesium as well. So now why would magnesium levels involve glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity or lead to insulin resistance if they're low? In order to be able to use glucose from the carbohydrates that we eat, it has to first get into our cells. And to do that, it has to cross over the cell membrane or the surface that surrounds each of our cells. Now, the way that that happens is through glucose transporters like GLUT4. Insulin is a hormone that's secreted by the beta cells of the pancreas, and it tells our cells to produce more glucose receptors like GLUT4 and translocate them to the membrane where they are expressed on the cell surface and help us to bring glucose across through the cell membrane and to be used as fuel for energy production within the cells. When that process becomes dysfunctional, like needing more and more insulin to send that same message to our cells, that's part of what we call insulin resistance and it can lead to abnormally high levels of insulin and abnormally high levels of blood glucose. Now, magnesium has several important effects on these pathways. We'll go through three of them. First, on the glucose transporters. Second, at the hormonal level, the insulin and glucagon level. And third, on pancreatic beta cell function. Starting at the beginning, magnesium is deeply involved in the proper expression and translocation to the membrane of glucose transporters. We know, for example, that if someone supplements with magnesium, they're going to upregulate their synthesis of glucose transporters like GLUT4 and also their translocation or migration to the cell surface. They can then bind glucose to help it come across into the cell. At the hormonal level or endocrine level, Magnesium acts at both ends of the spectrum. First, on the insulin parts of the pathway by upregulating insulin receptors and increasing their sensitivity to insulin, meaning that we need less insulin floating around outside the cell to do the same job. It also acts at the other end of the spectrum, which is glucagon. So glucagon is normally responsible for 
helping our cells to release glucose when it is needed to bring glucose levels up in the blood. Now that system contributes to higher glucose levels because more glucose is released from the cells, for example, of the liver. Magnesium downregulates glucagon receptors, which can help to improve glycemic control. And then number three is that magnesium helps the pancreatic beta cells or the cells that produce insulin and send it out to the body to sense levels of glucose and to properly release insulin. It does this by forming a complex with the main energy unit of the cell called magnesium ATP and working together with a molecule called glucokinase to help sense levels of glucose properly. It also helps with the release mechanisms of insulin by working with potassium channels and calcium channels. Now, mechanistic evidence like what we just talked about is great and it's important for knowing why things work, but we have to know that they work in humans. And so we need randomized controlled trials and crossover studies to be able to ensure that when we go to try to imply something in the clinic, that it will actually work in humans. And there have been a number of these looking at the effect of magnesium on insulin resistance and even diabetes. And one of the first studies to combine the results of prior clinical trials and crossover studies was a study published in 2016 in Pharmacologic Reviews. And this study combined the results of 21 randomized controlled trials and crossover studies across a range of health statuses of the participants, ranging from younger to older, to varying insulin sensitivity statuses, all the way from healthy to insulin resistant and pre-diabetic and diabetic, totaling about 1,300 subjects. And the bottom line of this study was that, in fact, magnesium supplementation across a range of doses of magnesium was, in fact, beneficial for improving laboratory markers of insulin resistance. The researchers reported that across all studies, magnesium supplementation was able to bring down a key marker, which is called HOMA-IR. This is a composite metric that utilizes fasting insulin and glucose to estimate insulin resistance, and this improved in both non-diabetic and diabetic participants. Now, the researchers also did something particularly insightful, which is they broke out the participants by duration of magnesium treatment, meaning that they isolated those that were on treatment for less than four months and those that were on treatment for four months or more. And what they found is that for the participants who were on magnesium supplementation for four months or longer, they were able to decrease their fasting glucose meaningfully by about 13 milligrams per deciliter and decrease their HOMA IR as well by about 1.3. Both of these are well within the realm of what we would consider clinically meaningful. The researchers also reported a trend level finding of decreased fasting insulin, but this didn't quite make the criteria for statistical significance. Not surprisingly, the researchers saw no change in hemoglobin A1C. And that's not surprising because hemoglobin A1C is going to be a lagging metric. It's a metric that estimates the average rolling blood glucose over a couple of months, usually two to three. Now, do we have other evidence that magnesium supplementation may be beneficial for insulin resistance? And in fact, we do specifically in diabetic subjects. Published in Frontiers of Nutrition was a recent meta-analysis of RCTs looking at 23 randomized controlled trials of magnesium supplementation in diabetic individuals. In addition to finding reductions in fasting glucose, they also saw improvements in systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And that's important from a cardiometabolic risk perspective. And it also makes sense because we know that insulin resistance can impair endothelial function and sensing, leading to elevated blood pressure. So the bottom line is that there's solid evidence that magnesium is beneficial for insulin resistance in improving insulin sensitivity. One question that people may have is, are there formulations of magnesium that are more optimal than others? when it comes to enhancing insulin sensitivity and improving insulin resistance. And before we talk about supplementation, I'd like to say that none of this is medical advice and you should always obtain the advice of your own physician before making any health decisions, but especially when it comes to things like supplementation or pharmacologics. For example, not everyone should be supplementing with magnesium. Those that are at higher risk of reaching super therapeutic levels or abnormally high levels of Magnesium are those, for example, with chronic kidney disease, particularly advanced chronic kidney disease, where people tend to retain magnesium, and that can cause problems if it runs out of control. Individuals with neuromuscular conditions also need to be careful about magnesium supplementation. 
And certainly everyone needs to consult their own personal physician. Now, generally speaking, we can group magnesium supplements into two categories, organic formulations of magnesium and inorganic formulations of magnesium. The organic formulations would be things like magnesium aspartate, magnesium glycinate, and magnesium citrate. These tend to be better absorbed. They can be more expensive. And the inorganic formulations of magnesium are things like magnesium oxide, which tend to be less expensive, but also tend to be more poorly absorbed or less bioavailable. It's important to know that magnesium oxide and the less expensive formulations of magnesium are still used in the clinic and they have important roles. They can be efficacious, but it's also important to know that any formulation of magnesium can cause GI side effects. Magnesium citrate, for example, is used clinically as a laxative and magnesium oxide can have similar GI effects, whereas magnesium glycinate tends to be on the milder end of the spectrum for GI side effects. The takeaway is that we have reasonable evidence to believe that multiple formulations of magnesium can be effective for improving insulin resistance. So with that, thanks for listening. If you want to support this channel, the very best way to do that is to hit the subscribe button and the like button. If you're on Spotify and are able to head over there and leave a review and a follow, it helps so that the algorithm can pick up the channel and share it with more people. So again, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.